right, hello everyone, my book nerds, my book club people. Every time I say that, my husband smiles or laughs. <laughs> I'm a nerd. He is. We both are. I get excited. If you don't know, okay, I'm, I'm really like, I'm nerdy. I'm goofy and I, I just get excited that like, I don't know why I didn't do this a long time ago. I, I'm just happy that I get to read this book literally on my channel. And if you're interested in listening to me read it to you, then that's even better. And, you know, so that's all. That's when I, I just get excited here. But anyway, hello to my book nerds, bookworm people. All right. Um, I like our little humble group that we have, you know? And so it's nice, like only specific people, not that many people like watch these videos. So it's really nice when like not that many do because I can see that like whoever does, it's like, okay, that's a book nerd out there, bookworm person. But anyway, hello, welcome back to uh, my video here. Uh, I'm Valencia with Val, 333 Tarot with Spirit. We're just gonna jump right in and just read and relax here for today. And um, if you'd like to uh, tarot and more tarot readings, please go ahead and check out my husband's tarot channel at Sidekick Tarot. And uh, yeah, that's about it. We're just gonna jump in. So today I'm reading um, chapters 10, 11, and 12 of Comfortably Insane, A Journey from the Hell of Alcoholism to a healthy productive life by Neil Linares. And I don't know if I've mentioned this, but well, I did the first um, the first video, chapter one. The author is like, he. this is his life. So I don't know if you knew that, like this, we're reading his life. This is what happened to him. All right. So well, let's get, jump, jump right into it here. Okay. So uh, page 47. So we're starting here, chapter 10, back in the USA. Quote, land of the free and the home of the brave. End quote, the star spangled banner. This time I was going to do better in Utah. I was determined. I had come back the summer night before 11th grade. The plan was for me to go to the local high school, Woods Cross in the fall. As soon as I arrived to Utah, I immediately started causing trouble. Mike, one of my friends from childhood came over. He was so excited that I was back. He rode his bike to my house and asked me to join him on a bike ride. I honestly was happy to see him, but I said I can't go out and I never talked to him again. Not sure why I reacted this way. The awkward feelings I had always felt, that I had always felt were inside were amplified. But now I also felt dirty. I really didn't want to share time with anyone. I thought I was secure in who I was, but I couldn't get past those feelings. A month or two into summer, I was hanging out with another school friend. Unlike Mike, he was a drinker. This let me feel okay. I guess I needed to be around people that drank. We drank a lot of beer that day and were playing basketball at the elementary school I had attended when I was smaller. It was near the apartments where I used to live. I had gotten so drunk I could barely stand, but I continued playing. I shot the ball and fell flat on my face. I severely scratched the top of my forehead, nose, and lip. It wasn't a pretty sight. Later that day, I was driving to another friend's house and a cop pulled me over. I was so drunk that I could barely stand. The cop took me in. My dad picked me up later. When I went to court, I tried to blame the injuries on him, but the judge knew better and so did my parents. The next day, I woke up with that familiar hangover, both moral and physical. To drown out that moral hangover, my, hangover my emotions, I had developed a technique that allowed me to drink in my room without anyone finding out. I'd throw the beer cans out my window However, it was only possible during the winter because the snow would hide the cans. When summer came, I was horrified at the number of beer cans that had piled up. I quickly picked them up before anyone found out. Minor nuances. Later that day, I got a call from two of my friends to go hang out in downtown Salt Lake City. We met at the bus stop. I was sporting my huge scrapes on my forehead and upper lip. I had put a hat on to try and cover them up but couldn't do that so well because the hat lined up right with my scrape and it hurt too much. As we waited, my mind was racing. I felt deep anxiety. I didn't want to go yet I didn't want to stay home. As I was going through this, my mom passed by with my aunt and twin cousin. I love them both. They stopped the car and made me get in. I happily complied. I was embarrassed with my friends and my family but it was the perfect cover so I did not have to explain to my friends that I did not want to go. I often wonder about the coincidence of them showing up at that moment. Not that I was always protected from my bad choices, but I often found a way to avoid consequences. My older friend Oscar had a car, so it was really convenient to hang out with him. 
we had decided to go to a club in Salt Lake City. As we drove on State Street a little past 12 a.m., he made a wrong turn into a one-way street. He immediately tried to correct, but it was too late. The police lights glared at us from behind. The cop walked over to us slowly, pointing a flashlight at us. He was very serious and cautious. He asked us to step outside of the car. It did not take long to see how intoxicated we were. He immediately put Oscar in handcuffs and in his police car. He looked at me and must have noticed that I was underage, so he said, scram before I arrest you too. He got in the car and left. So there I was on the state street, not knowing my way around and drunk. I anxiously started to walk home to the best of my ability. At a distance, I saw the state capitol and realized I needed to go that direction to get to North Salt Lake City. Unfortunately, it also meant walking on the freeway. It was crucial that cars didn't see me, especially a police officer, as I was violating curfew. I walked and walked. It was pitch dark and scary. When I saw car lights, I would find the most convenient bush, cement block, or whatever else I could find to hide behind. As I approached the freeway, there were no more bu bushes, just the freeway. Thankfully, there were plenty of side railings that I could hide behind as soon as I saw lights. I combined running with walking, and if I saw lights, I would jump to the other side of the cement railing. I would lie still until the car passed, protected by the darkness. That thought was crazy. I had always correlated darkness with insanity, but for now, it was my comfort and protection. I would later understand this better. This strategy got me to North Salt Lake. Once there, I had to be ex extra careful because the officers there not only knew me, but they also seemed to always be waiting for me. At least that's what it felt like. My dad had shared with me that they would wait for him as well. I crouched behind some bushes before entering, carefully scoping out the exit ramp. Military school training was really paying off. Haha. <laughs> Once I was in the neighborhood, I ran from the bush to bush. I knew if I could get to the elementary school, I was home free. That was my turf, and I couldn't get caught there. I knew all the places to hide, so I did just that. I walked past the basketball court where I had fallen and scraped my forehead and upper lip, then went through the small walkway through the chain link fence right past the school. That's where we played with all our friends as little kids. I thought, what has happened to me? What am I doing? I ran up the hill past the spot where I had crashed my bike just a few years before. It reminded me of the first time I felt that void of emotion when I had walked with my scraped knee and my dis uh, dismembered bike. It seemed like an eternity ago. I also ran past my old apartment. I smelled the chocolate chip cookies for my mom when she had made them for us when we got home from school that time. I saw another car light, up, light come up and instinctively hid behind a bush. Finally, I made it home. I felt safe, but I had no victorious feelings, no victory lap, no sense of accomplishment or relief, void of emotion. I walked to my room, put the music on as loud as I could without waking anyone, and went to sleep. And here it says, there's a picture, and it says, chain linked fence pathway that connected school and apartment neighborhood. So that's the picture of it, what it looked like. By now, I had earned a DUI and a couple of arrests under my belt. My life was simplified. I couldn't drive, but I could still drink. Perfect, just the way I liked it. That fall, I started, to, I started school back up. In military school, I had developed a sense of discipline, but at Woods Cross High School, I had none. However, I was smarter. Why get in trouble with teachers and principals? My old principal from junior high was now in Woods Cross and was very kind to me. He acknowledged once how sharp I looked. It was the weirdest feeling. I dressed much better than the black t-shirts and worn out jeans I used to wear. But inside, I felt so unworthy of everything. The anxious feelings came back strong as ever. They haunted me for many years. I was uneasy and anxious all the time. At nights, I would put music on as loud as I could just to help quiet my mind. Life continued as did the arrests. It seemed I was in court every Monday or so. One time after drinking with my brother and a friend, we ended up at a gas station close to the house. As kids, we stopped here a lot to buy candy and stuff. My brother and friend had gone inside and were playing video games. I was passed out in the car and when I woke up, I was confused and tried to start the car so I could go home. 
but I couldn't start it and the car rolled backwards into the street. Officers promptly came. Once again, they took me in. This time, my dad picked me up. He didn't say a word. He really did. He would show his feelings by not saying anything. I was used to it. I was taken to court once again, and the judge suggested strongly I go to a rehab center. Lesson learned. Planning to do better is not enough. We need to create solutions through the help of others. Lastly, take action to make sure not everything is wasted. All right, next chapter. The first step, quote, the first step is always the hardest, end quote, unknown. My mom drove me to the rehab center. I had tried everything in my power to manipulate the situation and get out of it. I had no success, so I relied on the skills of bending and adjusting. Good old survival mode, show no emotion. My mind was the strongest thing I possessed, even though it was insane. Because they wanted me to go, I had to go, but I decided I would just play along until I saw the crack in the system and then jump through to get away and do what I wanted. So ha, another learned skill in military school. Once we got there, my mask came on. A guy who seemed not to have a worry in the world nonchalantly escorted me into a room. He asked me to change into a robe that was lying on the bed. The room was cold and very bright. He also gave me a pamphlet and said, write down why you can't stop eating. I thought, this is a weird request. However, I quickly figured out they had mistaken me for someone else. I thought, perfect. It was the beginnings of the crack I was looking for. I wrote nonsense like I liked eating burgers because they're really tasty and snicker bars because they're crunchy. Just silly stuff like that. When he came back, he took the writing pad, read it, briefly looked at me and left. He came back without a word, smile or any emotion and had me dress back into my clothes. Then he patiently took me to a group of kids who were sitting around in a circle. I felt above everyone in there as soon as I heard the subject. They were discussing the Alcoholics Anonymous step one. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. I was floored and felt sorry for everyone in there. I heard the kids describe how they had suffered with alcohol. One kid had just reached something like 30 days of sobriety and they asked him to share. He said he felt uncomfortable since I was new. I immediately and energetically offered to leave, but he said no and shared. I was so impressed by the openness of everyone, but not in a good way. I felt sorry for them and wanted to get out of there. After a few hours, I realized I was going to be there for quite some time, maybe a few weeks. I didn't like the idea, but my mindset was strong and I could go through anything without really showing who I was. I later learned that was easy for me because I had no clue who I was. As I was preparing my mind to get through rehab, surprisingly, my mom came back to get me. She later explained that she talked to her sister and she had urged her to take me out. Whatever was protecting me had provided the lesson I needed at this moment. All I needed at this moment was to be exposed to step one. I wasn't ready for full rehabilitation as I needed to first realize I was powerless over alcohol. Now that I'm a parent, I've begun to understand what turmoil my parents must have gone through in their attempts to help me. After this experience, I was able to settle down just for a bit in my life. Those kids had an impact on me and I never forgot what they were saying. I just didn't relate. I ridiculed them whenever I would tell someone about my rehab story. I thought, I'm not powerless over alcohol. Maybe someday I'll even prove it. It didn't take long to end up with another DUI. It's funny how things tend to work out. I think back and am amazed how easily I got into trouble. This time my dad was with me in court. The judge said, I don't ever want to see you here again. I replied almost mockingly, your honor, I'm going to probably be back next week because I just got caught again this weekend. He threatened to put me in juvenile detention. I laughed a bit and said I would love to go and make some friends there. In reality, inside, I was very afraid. Barely keeping himself from yelling, he said, 
I order you to immediately go to juvenile detention. I turned pale. However, my dad intervened. He said, Your Honor, I'm setting up a business in Miami and leaving in a couple weeks. Please let me take him with me. The judge was hesitant at first, but agreed to allow that. As we drove home, my dad didn't say a word, but it was understood I was going to Miami. Lesson learned. Some lessons start without us even knowing they have started. We only learn in hindsight as we realize we were taught, we were being taught a lesson. It's impossible to determine how long it can take to fully learn. All right. Welcome to my, or last chapter we'll read today. Welcome to Miami. It's a, I believe it's a lyrics to a song. So quote, end quote, quote. Yeah, 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 Miami. Uh-uh, South Beach, it's by Will Smith, okay? <laughs> South Beach, bringing the heat. Uh, ha ha, can y'all feel that? Can y'all feel that? Jig it out. Here I am in the place where I come to let go. Miami, the base, the sunset low. Every day like a Mardi Gras, every day party. Everybody party all day. No work, all play, okay? So we sip a little something, lay the rest, the spill. Me and Charlie at the bar running up a high hill. Nothing less than ill when we dress to kill. Every time the ladies pass, they be like, hi, Will. I actually remember that song. End quote. Will Smith, partial lyrics to Welcome to Miami. <laughs> All right. We loaded the cars. My dad was driving one car and we were hauling my brother's hatchback Toyota Corolla. My brother had worked so hard at his job to get money to customize it the way he wanted it. He had installed new Pirelli tires. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Pirelli or Pirelli tires and a brand new Pioneer stereo. It had original leather seats and beautiful acrylic blue paint. Dad and I were going to drive to first drive to Miami to set the groundwork for getting the business up and running and to find a place to live. Then the rest of the family would come. In retrospect, I learned to admire my dad for taking risks. I understood that sometimes the decisions he made weren't the best ones but boy, did he fight to provide for his family. And this must have been a huge risk for him. It was a really long trip. The desire to drink was huge. I slept most of the way as it felt like I couldn't bond with him anyway, but some seeds were planted, eventually improving our father-son relationship. When we arrived to Miami, we immediately got lost and ended up back in a bad part of town, hauling a sparkling blue car in the back. We knew we were attracting the wrong attention, so we were relieved when we found our way and arrived at our location, my dad's friend's house where we stayed for about a week. Eventually, we found a little apartment on a popular street in Miami called Calle Ocho. I helped my dad find the building for the new business. We were both excited about this business dream. Things were very different than Salt Lake City. It seemed more like El Salvador, but modern. I went from high school senior class of 300 students to a senior class of 900. I was in awe of the size of the school. The halls had so many kids you could barely walk. While I was intimidated, you would never know it. I kept to myself and just tried to learn this new environment. At this time, I was fluent in Spanish, but when I listened to most people, I couldn't understand the Spanish they spoke because it was so fast. I was continually asking them to speak English instead. This went on for about a month. It wasn't easy. In one of my classes, a dude was flicking papers up front and hit a really big kid. The kid stood up slowly, walked toward him, and just punched him square in the face, then returned to his seat as if nothing happened. I asked the guy if he was okay. He was stunned and then said, yeah, I'm fine. I thought, I'm definitely not in Utah anymore. This kid and I became good friends. He asked if I drank and I enthusiastically said yes. Here, I would drive my brother's car. One time during lunch with my newfound friend, we bought a six pack of beer. I was surprised that there was no issue buying beer as we were underage. Again, another perk of the Miami lifestyle. We parked at the side of the school's baseball field, which seemed pretty isolated. I opened the beer almost reverently and guzzled it down in one swallow. It was so soothing to me. I know it had been exactly one month since my last drink because I was counting the days. Ever since I had arrived to Miami, I had been with my dad the whole time, so I had not found a way to drink. While drinking, some police officers saw us. 
They aggressively pulled up in front of us and asked us to get out of the car. Searching it, they promptly found the three beers that were left. They just opened all three beers and poured them out in the back seat. I knew at that point they weren't going to arrest us, but their style was way different than the officers from Utah. I had a multicolored stick in the back of the car that had been left there by my mom. She was a school teacher and used it to teach kids how to count. The officers thought it was a weapon to fight with, which I thought was very odd. Later, when I learned more about Miami, it all made sense. They had huge problems with gangs, and I was in a rough high school, so every little thing was looked upon as dangerous. I guess beer wasn't so dangerous because they were dealing with cocaine, guns, gangs, and other things. They laughed at us and my beer smelling car, courtesy of them, and told us to scram. Believe it or not, I was an exceptional student at Miami Senior High. I had not made many friends and wasn't drinking heavily and was barely going out. Really, I was being closely watched by my dad, so it was almost impossible. So I studied and paid attention. I even made the honor roll. Internally, however, I was at an all time low. I felt out of place, wanting to belong, but really not knowing how. Now that I wasn't drinking so much, the feelings of not fitting in returned. I reverted to isolation. I did that very well. About three months in, I started to adjust and began skipping school and partying more and more. Since my dad had become busy with work, I got more space and freedom. He was unaware that I had now slipped back into my bad habits. Oddly enough, in spite of this, it felt as if my relationship with my dad improved. I really loved him. I just didn't know how to show it. Truth be told, I think he didn't know how to show it either. At school, I made a new friend who was a bartender and knew how to make all the drinks, which was great, but I really just liked beer. One Friday night, I was out and about and thought it might be better for me to stay the night at my friend's house because there was going to be lots of drinking. I called my dad to ask permission to sleep over. After a brief silence, he said, will you promise not to drive? I promised. For my dad, your word was really important. He really, he wanted to believe and trust, and he did. In my defense, so did I. I believed that I would be good when I talked to him, but I was fighting a battle that had already been lost. I just didn't realize it. We hung up, I was free, so I started drinking recklessly. I drank and drank. I was surprised how high my tolerance was. In the wee hours, my friends were falling asleep, I, on the other hand, kept drinking all throughout the night. I built a pyramid with the beer cans. I didn't sleep at all and drank by myself. Early in the morning when my friends awoke, we decided to go to Miami Beach. The combined IQ level of our group was very low. <laughs> Sorry, that's funny. That became apparent when it was decided I would drive. Well, maybe I decided. When we arrived, I started to experience the flickering light bulb blackouts off and on. I ran stop signs and was just being belligerent. This culminated in a multiple car crash. After the crash, I must have been knocked out. I awoke to people screaming. My head was warm with blood coming from a gash above my eye. I got out of the car and saw a guy standing there. I remember him asking if I was okay. Again, I must have blacked out because when I came to, I was in the ER and two officers were asking if I had a license. I said, yes, it's in the car. I had no idea what had happened. I was afraid and was alone. It was one of the scariest feelings. I felt that I could die and no one would care. Apparently, five cars had been involved in the accident. I ran a stoplight and a car slammed into me, driven by an older lady. She suffered a broken leg. God was powerful here because no one else died or got hurt. I received stitches on my eye and my end of my leg and half of my head felt numb. That numbness has never left to this day. I had that familiar feeling of protection with me except this time the guilt was so deep it was hard to feel good about having this type of protection. I truly wanted to disappear or just die. After this event things changed in my heart. For the first time I had deep introspection about my drinking and contemplated rehab. I questioned whether I was powerless to alcohol and if my life had become unmanageable. The next couple of years, I thought this over and over. The huge black eye and the stitches all over my body were tangible reminders 
that I was facing consequences that were beyond my understanding. Nothing made sense. My dad had picked me up from the hospital. When we arrived home, I sat at the kitchen table. He put both his hands on my shoulders and inspected my eye. I could see his eyes were moist. He then looked me straight in the eyes for a few seconds as if searching for words to say. I also looked back at him feeling lost and afraid. He then hugged me and held me. Although I couldn't return the hug, I could feel his love. I understood what he was trying to say. I loved him dearly as well. I went to court several times. A public defender was helping me. Once in court, the lady who had broken her leg chastised me. I was embarrassed and ashamed, but even though no one knew this, I was more grateful that she was okay. After several times of court proceedings, the judge finally said I was guilty. I was then placed on 50 hours of community service, required to attend an alcohol education program with 10 classes, and required to pay a fine. I attended the classes very begrudgingly, but I knew I had to be there. I submitted and declared myself a full-blown alcoholic, but I wasn't powerless over it. I know this doesn't make sense, but that's how I felt. It was full insanity and I liked it. Actually, the insanity had set in a long time ago for me, but for now it was take but now it was taking over. It was flexing its muscles. I could feel it, but I couldn't explain it. I participated in the alcohol education classes and gave as much input as possible. For the community service portion, the guy flat out asked me if I would rather pay him $100 and he would sign off on all the hours. I said yes and somehow got the money together. As this was winding down, he moved. we moved to a slightly better part of this town. That meant another school. So this would be my third high school during my senior year. I had started off at Woodcross High School, then went to Miami High, and ended up at Sunset Senior High. That was a winning formula for chaos. I was yearning for something but didn't know what it was or how to explain it. All I knew is that when I drank, the feeling stopped. At Sunset High School, I chose to be very low key. I scraped, I scraped by to graduation. I made zero friends. And honestly, the feeling of not belonging was as strong as ever. I became completely detached. I truly felt I was by myself, even though by this time, my family had all come from Utah and we were all together. I still didn't date much. I felt too inadequate. Lesson learned, a geographical change doesn't mean things will get better. And those are the chapters. That's where we're at here. All right, I'll be back tomorrow to probably read maybe like three more chapters. I think I might do three a day with you guys because they're pretty quick, so. All right, like I said, this book gets crazier as it goes on. So thank you. All right.